Tim, I present you with the Norman L. Bowen Award for outstanding contributions to volcanology, geochemistry, and petrology. Thank you, Tim. We will now have his lecture. Thank you, um, Bill. Thank you, Steve, for those kind words. Um, thank you, members of VGP and AGU. Uh, it's uh, truly an honor to be recognized in the name of uh, a rather young normal Norman Bowen, um, and I'm extremely humbled. Of course, uh, as uh, we all know, we owe uh, an enormous debt of gratitude to our students and postdocs, and I've had a great team, and I want to thank them here today. Um, Madison, Taya, Sweda, Gareth, Anita, Max and Toma, who've worked on petrological projects, Carolina, Jack, Yvonne, Mark, who worked on eruptive processes, and Laurence, uh, Caroline, and Olivier worked on laboratory experimentation on pyroclastic flows and caldera collapse processes. So if I'm here uh, today, it's to accept this award on very much on their behalf as well as my own. I've also collaborated with a fantastic team of people. These are a few of the collaborators over the last few years and I want to thank them very much for, their, for the openness or, or in the way in which they've, uh, uh, they've, they've collaborated. So um, when I was uh, a research student at Cambridge with, with Steve, I benefited enormously from Steve's great insight into volcanic and magmatic processes. And Steve taught me to view um, volcanoes in a holistic way uh, to try to quantify and, and, and just to have fun that research is fun. That's the way it should be. And then I moved on to the USGS and worked with Charlie Bacon and uh, I was very impressed by um, uh, the benefits of working on a long-term laboratory volcano, um, which in Charlie's case was uh, Mazama. And so when I came back to Europe, I decided to have a long-term system myself um, where I could um, ask fundamental questions and test hypotheses, and I chose Santorini, and I want to tell you about some of the things that we've learnt uh, at Santorini over the years, particularly in the last few years. So Santorini is a great place for studying caldera um, forming eruptions, and why do we do that? Well, of course, um, there's a caldera forming eruption somewhere in the world every few decades, uh, with uh, large, potentially large, uh, local to global uh, impacts. So um, understanding why and how caldera forming eruptions occur is of great societal interest. Now, if you're going to form uh, a caldera forming eruption, you need a magma chamber in the upper crust and uh, a chamber full of mobile, eruptible magma. And uh, you've got to generate that magma chamber in the context of the uh, mush paradigm, which has been prevalent over the last decade or so. And this is the idea that, in fact, magmas are stored for long periods uh, underneath volcanoes as crystal mushes, locked in crystal mushes. And uh, the mushes cool conductively and therefore could be stored uh, just above their solidus uh, for very long periods of time. Liquid chambers, on the other hand, convect and cool rapidly. So I put this slide together, and I hope the text isn't too small for the people at the back. I was expecting a bigger screen. Um, so we can create a mush body, and we can do that up temperature by melting crust or defrosting pre-existing plutons. And then we can form eruptable magma in three ways. We can uh, we mobilize that mush and, and erupt the mush as a crystal-rich eruption, crystal-rich ignimbrite, for example, like the monotonous intermediates. Or we can compact the mush, segregate off the interstitial uh, liquid, and uh, erupt a crystal-poor magma, 
uh, as, uh, as an ignin bright, for example. And we can segregate that liquid either within the mush itself or we can transfer it upwards to higher structural levels. Santorini magmas are crystal poor and so we have to go through these stages to mechanisms two or three. So that's what I'll be focusing on. An example of mechanism three is, uh, is the deep hot zone model which has um, been very influential in the last few years and this is the idea where uh, at least in young cool arc crust, um, you generate your silicic magmas fairly deep in the crust and transfer them upwards to pre-eruptive reservoirs in the upper crust. This model may not be uh, applicable to um, larger epicontinental um, uh, supersized calderas where the thermal footprint is much, much larger and the system is much longer lived. Um, the work by Catherine Annan and people on uh, thermal modeling shows that if you do transfer stuff up from the deeper in the crust to the upper crust, you have to do so at a rate uh, above a certain level if you're going to form a magma chamber, because otherwise the, uh, the magma will uh, suffer plutonic death. And that, that critical value is somewhere in the order of, of 10 to the minus 2 cubic kilometers per year, plus or minus an order of magnitude. Another concept that's been um, influential is the idea that large shallow magma chambers are, are transient features on geological timescales. And this has come about principally because when we do geophysics on calderas, we don't tend to see them. And uh, this is an example uh, of Tober, um, where, um, Tober caldera in Indonesia, where uh, you see a, a stack sills in the deep crust, but there's, there's no shallow uh, magma body. So here are some time scales, and, and I drew this diagram up with a, an arc system like Santorini in mind. Um, the time scales of some different processes, uh, the uh, pluton construction over the lifetime of the volcano, the construction of individual uh, mush bodies within that pluton, and then the uh, formation of uh, magma, of um, melt-dominated magma chamber uh, from those mushes. And uh, some, some models for chamber assembly have involved a slow chamber assembly over many thousands of years. And uh, more recently, people have been coming up with uh, faster models uh, on the um, century to decadal timescales. And uh, I, I want to show you in this talk some of the evidence for the faster assembly model. So uh, these are the uh, questions on what time scales do large shallow chambers of melt-rich magma assemble, what might the mechanisms be, and also how does the system behave in between the large eruptions. So Santorini's uh, situated on the Aegean Island arc here. Um, the uh, subduction of the African plate uh, is in, in this direction, and when you zoom in, uh, Santorini actually lies on a northeast southwest trending uh, rift zone, which is parallel to the subduction vector. I want to stress the importance of field mapping. If you're going to understand your volcanic system, then um, you should uh, understand the stratigraphy of the volcano. And I'm uh, probably preaching to the converted here, but um, younger people take note. Uh, this is a, a geological map that I uh, produced with Mark Davis many years ago with a zoom on the uh, northern part of the uh, caldera where uh, you have complex uh, interdigitation of tuff and lava remnants and you have to unravel all that to sort out your stratigraphy. I've been very privileged uh, to work um, with Marvin Lanfair and later on Stefan Skye on potassium argon and argon argon dating of the Santorini system. And uh, these are some of the data showing that the system uh, has been active since a little over half a million years and uh, essentially uh, active uh, since then, pretty much continuously until the present day. And it's also uh, satisfying to see that the absolute ages agree pretty well with the field stratigraphy, uh, the map units here shown on the right.
So um, this is the uh, volcanic history of the system. Uh, following some early uh, activity shown in green, explosive volcanism uh, began in a vengeance about 300,000 years ago. And with about 12 Plinian eruptions in, in that time, uh, red, rhyodacite magma, uh, blue, mainly dacitic to silicic andesite. And uh, these eruptions are several to several tens of cubic kilometers in, of crystal poor intermediate to silicic magmas. And then interplinian periods shown in brown, uh, prolonged periods of effusive and weak explosive eruptions with durations up to uh, about 40,000 uh, years and the present day interplinian period forming the Kamini Islands in the center of the caldera where the time averaged eruption rate is about 10 to the minus three cubic kilometers per year. About typical for an arc system. And this is just to remind me to point out the three eruptive units that I'll be talking about. The uh, Late Bronze Age eruption here, three and a half thousand years ago. The Cape Reaver eruption, 22,000 years ago. And a sequence of lavas that preceded it, um, the Therizia lavas, uh, extruded over an interplinian period of about 15,000 years. So I've got a two or three slides on the, uh, what we've learned about the caldera. Uh, this is a beautiful bathymetric map. Um, unfortunately, we have the lights. Uh, the um, bathymetric map from Evi Nomaku and, and colleagues. And uh, the work we've done has shown that uh, there's been at least four caldera collapses at this uh, system. The earliest one, 170,000, is not shown here. Uh, one at 70,000, one at 22,000, one at 3.6,000. And then in between the collapses, of course, you, you form intracaldera edifices that partly or totally fill in the caldera. So the system is multicyclic, with the caldera collapsing at pretty much the same place each time. The uh, caldera today is also a composite structure. Um, the green cliffs in the south uh, are morphologically very fresh, and they formed 3,500 years ago in the LBA eruption. And, um, the cliffs in the north, in the red cliffs, uh, much more uh, eroded, uh, denuded, and in places with bits of LBA tuff uh, on them. It took as many years to find these. They're not very obvious. And uh, a nice study has been done by Constantin Athanasis recently um, in collaboration with my group um, using chlorine-36 cosmic cosmogenic exposure uh, dating of the cliffs uh, and Constantin got dates of up to 16,000 years for some of these cliffs, okay, confirming that they existed prior to the uh, last eruption. So this is a, a toolkit of um, methods that could be applied to other calderas if, if you've got enough, um, enough, enough exposure. The um, caldera is absolutely not uh, a classic ring fracture caldera. Uh, it's strongly controlled by tectonics, particularly by fault systems parallel to the, uh, to the rift zone. And there's a, a, a strange feature of the caldera that we don't yet fully understand, uh, and that is that when you plot out isopacks of the um, different Pliny and fall deposits, uh, they indicate vents that are always situated uh, roughly here in the center of the caldera where the Kamini Islands are. So it's essentially a central um, conduit system um, and each time a caldera collapse takes place uh, the caldera uh, subsides by down faulting or down sagging around this long-lived um, central conduit system which is then reactivated after the collapse so we don't quite understand yet how that uh, how that happens okay so I want to get back to uh, my central question which is um, magma chamber formation and we've used three techniques in uh, recent years that I just briefly want to explain to you. Uh, the first is phase equilibrium experimentation. And this was done by uh, my colleagues at Orléans, Anita Cadu, uh, Joanne Andujar, and Bruno Scaillet. And we've used phase equilibrium in to get two types of information. Now, here's our, uh, here's our silicic pumice with um, interstitial melt, phenocrysts, and the cause to the phenocrysts. 
And uh, of course, we can do experiments on these uh, bulk pumices. And in a classic way, we can try to reproduce the phenocrystal glass compositions. And if we do, we get information about the pre-eruptive storage conditions, the PTX pre-eruptive storage conditions. But then we can take potential parents, um, andesites, basalts, and do experiments on them and try to produce uh, the uh, pumice as the residual melt composition uh, of, of our parent. And if we're lucky, and it's the case at Santorini, if we're lucky, um, the uh, phenocrystals being, having the compositions of the cores of our phenocrysts. And that gives us information on the uh, production, the source conditions for our silicic magma. So we get two types of information, the source conditions and the pre-eruptive storage conditions. And uh, my colleagues have done a very large number of experiments on uh, silicic magmas, andesite, basalt, um, in, in three large Journal of Petrology papers. So it's a, it's a lot of data involved. And then we can refine those by using melt inclusions and uh, melt inclusion volatile barometry. If we get melt inclusions from the rims of the crystals, then we can refine the pre-eruptive storage conditions. If we get them from the cores of the crystals, we can maybe um, refine the uh, source conditions. Now that gives us a fluid pressure, of course, using solubility models. And if we want to convert that to a total pressure, we need to know that our system is fluid saturated. Um, it's an assumption often made for OX systems. We decided to test it. And these are melt inclusion data from uh, a range of different uh, magmas, H2O against K2O, which is incompatible. And uh, most of the melt inclusion suites are relatively flat on this diagram, showing that water behaves compatibly during differentiation. And uh, that shows that you must have a, a fluid present, must be fluid saturated. Even if you have hornblende or biotite, you, you can't produce that. So, so we, we can, with confidence, convert fluid pressures to total pressures, uh, at least for upper crustal conditions. And then the third technique is diffusion chronometry. And this technique is where um, you grow a core to a crystal. Could be plagioclase, could be peroxine. And then you change the PTX conditions and you overgrow a yellow rim. And some element then has a profile like this, concentration profile. And if we leave, then leave that crystal under the yellow conditions, then that um, core rim boundary is going to diffuse. And we can get time scale information from that if we know the diffusion coefficient and, and the temperature uh, constrained by ion titanium oxides or, or phase equilibrium. And that time scale, if we do that, that time scale is the time between the onset of rim formation and eruption quench. It's the uh, residence of that rim. So um, this is a uh, time average kind of petrological image of the subcaldera pluton based on melt inclusion and uh, phase equilibria data mainly. You've got pressure in megapascals on the left and depth on the right. You've got about 23 kilometers of uh, uh, rifted continental crust. And um, the, uh, to summarize a lot of data, um, basalt comes into the system. It fractionates to andesite at about 400 megapascals. The andesite fractionates to silicic magmas in the 200 to 400 megapascal range in, in this depth range here. And then the pre-eruptive storage of the silicic magmas is up here in the 100 to 200 megapascals range, with interplinian silicic magmas being stored a little bit shallower, for reasons we don't fully understand, than the plinian uh, silicic magmas, uh, which shown in, shown in yellow, interplinian in green, um, plinian in yellow. So the, um, the idea is then that we produce our silicic magmas down here in what I'll call the middle crust, in, in, in this part here, and we transfer them up by some mechanism to the upper crust, and it's the time scales and mechanism of that transfer that I'll be fo focusing on for the rest of the talk. So we've done a fairly detailed study of the LBA eruption, um, which uh, erupted several tens of cubic kilometers of magma, possibly up to as much as 80. It was preceded by 17,000 years of uh, interplinian activity. And the magma itself um, is, is a very homogeneous 
uh, well-mixed magma, showing that it came from a single uh, well-mixed magma chamber. That's an important uh, point. The only variation is in uh, crystal content, which range mostly in the 10%, but it does range from 5 to 20%. There are quenched andesitic enclaves in this magma, which have in the past been interpreted as uh, the trigger for the eruption, and uh, I'll cast some doubt on that um, a little later. If you're going to do diffusion chronometry, you need to understand your crystal cargo. So we've done a lot of work characterizing the phenocryst phases. The um, main phenocryst composition is the yellow composition here, uh, which is what is marked as rims, and they're really pretty uniform in composition. And then some of the phenocrysts, and they're the ones shown here, contain antichristic cores, uh, which is shown in uh, orange. And these cores are more calcic or more magnesium in composition than the, than the rims. So our interpretation of these, um, which I should show here for the plagioclases, this is a histogram of plagioclase composition, um, that the cores uh, are very um, heterogeneous in their composition, uh, ranging from AN90 right up to about AN30. Uh, the rims, the yellow rims, the phenocryst composition, much more constrained, and then you probably can't read this, but the euhedral um, edge of the rims, even more uh, uh, constrained, limited. So the way we interpret this is that um, these crystals are recording the convergence of PTX conditions of the magma towards a single well-stirred pre-eruptive reservoir. So if we can get a time scale off the core rim boundary here, that's telling us something about the time scale, I would contend, of chamber assembly. So um, we did this using magnesium and strontium diffusion in plagioclase back in 2012, and uh, we got time scales for the rim formation or the rim residence of uh, about a decade. Subsequently, the diffusion coefficients have been improved, so we're at about 60 years for the rim residence, which is extremely short, of course, geologically. We've now done that on peroxines in a paper that came out this year. And uh, here we've got uh, uh, profiles, compositional profiles in black and diffusion models in, in red, in OPX and CPX. And uh, these are histograms of the time scales that we get. And the blues are from the core rim boundaries. And the warm colors are from zone boundaries within the rims themselves. The core rim boundaries give time scales from 1,700 years down to about 100 years, but mostly in the, um, on the time scale of about 600 to 100 years. Within the rims, the time scales are less, as we would expect, uh, ranging from a few hundred years down to a few decades. So the conclusion of this then, overall, with the plagioclase, is that the rim residence, the phenocryst residence within the chamber uh, is, is a few, decade, a few um, centuries to a few decades, possibly up to uh, uh, 1,700 years. So this is very short compared to the overall 17,000 year uh, interplinian period before the eruption. So how can we explain that? Well, there are two possible explanations. One is that we grew our magma chamber over a much longer time scale, many thousands of years, and the crystals were simply extracted by sedimentation from the chamber. So that what we're measuring is, 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 are, the crystal, are the younger crystals, the ones that were still there at the time of eruption. So um, you can do a, a, an order of magnitude calculation um, if we take our magma chamber here as a sill, a kilometer thick, convecting away, convecting turbulently, in, in fact, then uh, the mechanism of sedimentation in that situation is that crystals um, convect around until they uh, statistically enter the stagnant boundary layer at the base of the chamber and then they sediment out. And the equations for that process um, were published by Martin and Oakes many years ago. So we can work out a crystal extraction characteristic time scale for, the, for this system and it turns out that that's about 10 to the 4 to the 10 to the 5 years. Very long because it's a very viscous magma and these are small crystals. So that's um, uh, one to two orders of magnitude um, larger than the uh, diffusion timescales 
uh, our residents from diffusion timescales. So that suggests that this mechanism can't be right, and uh, we're, we're led to the conclusion that there must indeed have been uh, one or more crystallization events in the centuries to decades prior to the eruption. So the question is, what, what were these crystallization events? And there's a number of possibilities, but for, for time purposes, I'll go straight to the mechanism that we favor. Um, these are melt inclusion entrapment pressures um, from plagioclases with the cores and the rims. And you can see that the melt inclusions in the rims were trapped at about four to, four to six, four to seven kilometers. And the melt inclusions in the cores record higher pressures up to uh, something like uh, 350 megapascals. So the interpretation of that is fairly straightforward. Uh, that the cores, the crystal cores, are coming from somewhere in the middle crust, being transferred up, and being overboned by the rims uh, in the upper crust. So if that interpretation is correct, then our time scales uh, are recording uh, that uh, transfer process. And that's completely consistent with the phase equilibria data. Um, the uh, Joe and Andrew Jars uh, store, um, uh, production um, conditions, what am I trying to say, source conditions, for uh, the LBA magma uh, is down here in this orange zone on a PT, a PT diagram. The pre-eruptive reservoir uh, magma chamber is in the yellow here. And uh, these lines are different crystal contents for the phase diagram for the LB magma from Anita Cadu's work and also the plagioclase composition shown here. So if we were to take our LBA melts and move them up uh, into the uh, magma chamber, then the phase diagram uh, tells us, and I haven't put all the uh, details of the phase diagram for the Raya Day site on here, tells us that we will crystallize about 5 to 20% of crystals of plagioclase, OPX and CPX, and this is exactly what we observe. So there's very good agreement between these two data sets. So um, this is our inferred sequence of events. We have prolonged melt generation and incubation in some mid-crustal diuretic or gabbroic melt mush body over 17,000 years. Then we have a high flux transfer up into the uh, upper crust over uh, uh, no more than about 1,700 years with phenocryst growth during ascent and cooling. Now, we don't know how much magma was actually transferred on that time because, of course, we only have a limited number of crystal time scales. But if we assume it was 25 cubic kilometers, um, then that gives us a transfer rate of 0 0.05 cubic kilometers per year. If it's 50 cubic kilometers, 0 0.1. But we're on that um, transfer uh, on the order of magnitude of 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 1 cubic kilometers per year. So we can put this in the context of what we know about the LBA eruption. This is a time scale here, um, interplinian period, LBA eruption. Uh, here's the preceding called irreforming eruption, the Cape Reaver. And in blue, the prolonged incubation and production of the LBA melt over many thousands of years, and then in red, the uh, rapid transfer over a matter mainly of centuries. Um, the, uh, we do have a crypto uh, uh, tephra layer in the eastern Mediterranean with LBA composition. It's 12,000 years, so we know a little bit of this magma was leaking out uh, as early as 8,000 years before the eruption. So, um, what can we say about the transfer mechanism, if all this is correct? Well, we can say that the uh, time scale of melt extraction is far too long for compaction-driven intergranular flow, uh, which operates on time scales of 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5 years. And the only way we can explain this transfer is first, the melt was already segregated, pre-segregated in the source region into melt layers, and second, if it was transferred up rapidly in dikes. This is a diagram from a recent paper by Matt Jackson and colleagues, and Matt's presenting this tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, Matt and his colleagues have numerically been producing uh, mush bodies 
in the deep crust, uh, letting these mush bodies compact. Uh, the interstitial melts uh, uh, migrate upwards and accumulate at the top of the mush body as melt layers, almost pure melt, um, that you could then potentially um, uh, bring together and dike uh, to higher structural levels. The point is that these models, which I think are very elegant, uh, explain a long period of production and segregation of silicic magmas, uh, of silicic melt, and then potentially uh, the rapid transfer of that through dikes to higher levels. So these two different timescales that we think we're seeing in the Santorini data. So this is our, our model, um, the uh, prolonged uh, production of melt layers uh, of LBA melt uh, uh, in, in the mid-crustal, maybe lower crustal as well, levels of the pluton over many, many thousands of years. And then within a few centuries of the eruption, um, the uh, interconnectivity of these melt layers and their diking up towards uh, the top of the pluton where they accumulate to form our magma chamber. And the magma is then mixed convectively and later erupted. So um, presumably, if we transfer this melt up over a few centuries, uh, we have to subside at the pluton, um, conserving volume and making space for the magma chamber by uh, floor subsidence. And of course, floor subsidence is a very well-known mechanism in, uh, for making space for granites in the crust. That's well documented. It's interesting to ask the question, well, why would this um, melt stop here and not just dike straight to the surface and erupt immediately? I wonder whether the top of the pluton doesn't correspond to the brittle ductile transition. And so the melts are diking up until it's reaching the rheological boundary between the mushy pluton and the cold subsolidus brittle crust above, uh, silling out and forming this transient uh, uh, holding chamber. So what could have ultimately triggered the eruption? This is, this is uh, in some respects, speculative. But um, we do have evidence, cryptic evidence, um, for that the eruption followed long period, uh, many centuries, of sustained silicic recharge, high flux recharge. So that, with presumably the eruption was ultimately the result of that. Um, it must have developed an overpressure prior to um, uh, eruption. Uh, pressure development in this uh, growing magma chamber would be highly complex. Um, the uh, input rate and volatile X solution would tend to uh, increase the pressure, whereas floor subsidence and uh, any wall deformation would tend to decrease the pressure. And so ultimately, the pressure development would be a balance. We do have uh, evidence for a final silicic input within two years of the eruption, and it's these melt inclusion data I showed you earlier, because you can do a calculation to show that these core-hosted melt inclusions would re-equilibrate diffusively at the higher structural level within two years. And so there must have been an input uh, at least um, no longer than two years prior to the eruption. Maybe that was the one that managed to push the system um, uh, over it, uh, its limit and trigger the eruption. Um, the mafic enclaves have been interpreted as traditionally as the eruption trigger. I wonder whether that's the case now that we know there was lots of uh, silicic magma coming in, and uh, I throw this idea that maybe the enclaves are, were just a passive participant. They're obvious because they're quenched, um, but maybe we overestimate their importance. And then finally, of course, in another respect, the eruption was triggered um, many centuries before. So even this concept of eruption triggered, triggering in this model becomes uh, somewhat ambiguous. Now, Gareth Fabro has done a, a similar study with all these different techniques on the 22,000-year Cape Reaver eruption and comes up with a, quite a similar story. And so we think this might be a general sort of process at Santorini. Um, I want to finish then with the question, well, what happens to the silicic magmas during the interplinian periods? Um, Gareth uh, also did a study of a sequence of lavas, silicic lavas, which leaked out um, over about 15,000 years prior to this Cape Reaver eruption. Cape Reaver is about 10 cubic kilometers of magma minimum, 
And these lavas, about two cubic kilometers, uh, erupted in about 10 lava flows. So here's the, uh, the Therizia lavas, and they collapse during the Cape River eruption. All these are day sites. They're compositionally rather similar. So the Therizia sequence here is preserving a record of what happens over the 15,000 years prior to the Cape River eruption. These are histograms of plagioclase composition, the green being for the four different phases of the Cape Reaver eruption. And you can see that the plagioclase cargo is all the same. So it's a well-mixed reservoir chamber of, of magma, just like the LBA one. On the left, we've got the uh, plagioclase cargoes of different lava, four different lava flows of the Therizia sequence. Um, and you can see that they're, they're variable. So these are, the Therizia are small batches of day sites coming up and crystallizing their own uh, plagioclase cargoes. Whereas in the Cape Reaver, we've got a single well-mixed reservoir. So the two systems slightly different. On the other hand, if we do the diffusion uh, modeling in orthoproxene on the left, plagioclase on the right, Therizia lavas, on the top, Cape Reva pumice on the bottom, then uh, the uh, diffusion residence timescales for the phenocris are all the same. They're all centuries to decades. So that's rather surprising given the difference in scale of the two systems and suggests that um, uh, maybe the, uh, the phenocris production processes are rather similar in the two cases, and the timescales are similar despite the differences in scale. So what does that mean? Well, um, this is a horrible cartoon, grossly oversimplified, but it does permit me to convey to you uh, a working model that I have in my head of how the system might operate, that um, basaltic magma comes in to the um, crust, uh, it differentiates ultimately to uh, silicic magma, which segregates by um, compaction-driven uh, segre um, uh, segregation. At some rate, Q1. Now, Q1, uh, we don't, must depend on the basaltic input. We don't know how it would vary, so I've shown it as a kind of squiggly green line on the graph. Um, and then this silicic magma is transferred upwards to form transient magma chambers in the upper crust at some rate Q2. And Q2 must depend on Q1, but modulated by the rheological behavior of the pluton with these instability events. So Q2, during interplinian periods, and, and you should move this over to the left slightly. It's, uh, I noticed this morning it's slightly to the right. Um, during interplinian periods, we get uh, a small, uh, small transfers and uh, the system, uh, the upper crustal systems in uh, pluton building mode and uh, small interplinian eruptions, and then we'll get a big burp um, and uh, mag a large quantity of silicic magma will be transferred up, forming a transient big magma chamber uh, and getting a, a plinian eruption and caldera collapse. So a decoupling then between Q2 and Q1 seems, I, I, would, I, I envisage, determines the dynamics of the system. So here's a summary. The LB magma had a two-stage history, long generation and segregation of evolved melts, a depth followed by rapid transfer to the top of the pluton. And the phenocryst growth seems to record the injection and mixing of successive recharges of silicic melt into the inflating magma chamber. The chamber inflation involves sustained high flux melt transfer at rates which are much higher than the time average eruption rate at the volcano. The large upper crustal magma chambers beneath Santorini are transient features assembled on timescales much shorter than the preceding interplinian period. And I would contend that if seismic tomography had been available 500 years before the eruption, that uh, we'd have seen a thick column of uh, uh, crystal marsh or some deep sill complex, but not a large shallow chamber of melt. So I think this uh, re repeated destabilization of the Santorini Pluton offers an interesting way of possibly reconciling continuous supply of basaltic magma and heat to the base of the crust with the intermittency of large silicic eruptions. 
Is the process a common one? Um, well, uh, we don't know. Um, uh, Colin Wilson and uh, colleagues have done uh, very detailed studies of, of some of the uh, eruptions of the Taupo Volcanic Zone and come up with uh, stories that are, have some similarities with the one I've given today, uh, including the supersized uh, Aronui Tuff. What processes could trigger the instability uh, and melt transfer events? Well, it could be a regional seismic event, it could be deep basaltic intrusion, or it could be that the pluton just becomes spontaneously um, unstable once the uh, fraction of melt layers and the geometry of those melt layers exceed some sort of threshold. And then finally, what geophysical and geochemical signals would accompany uh, chamber assembly over the centuries to decades if we're, if we're right in, in our interpretation of the data? Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. A great talk. I'd like to open it to questions. We are suffering a little bit with technical challenges. We do not have a microphone. So raise your hand high and speak loud. Questions, please. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. That's a very good point. Um, we assume a step function. Well, in the plagioclases, we didn't. We used the um, strontium content to, to reconstruct what the initial magnesium profile would have been, and then we diffused from a reconstructed initial condition. Um, in the proxines, we assume a step function, and um, that is an assumption, and that means that the time scales I gave you, and I forgot to say this rather stupidly, um, are maximum estimates because you're ignoring any possible growth zoning. So all the time scales I give you are maximum estimates. Well, I said diking, but you probably saw on the slide, I also put high, some high permeability conduits. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't like to say that it's actually a kind of classic dike, but all, all we can say if our interpretation is correct is that the flux was high, much higher than compaction-driven intergranular flow could, could explain. So it's some sort of rapid transfer. Behind Zelmer, yes, please. Um, the, the melt inclusion data su suggests that the, um, from, from these uh, water behaving compatibly, um, su suggest that uh, it's water saturated um, at least in the upper uh, 10 kilometers or so. Um, deeper than that, we don't have any uh, information. Any more questions, please? How do you know the diffusion happened all times? How do you know there was never a time where it was cool enough? Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, these rims uh, are rather constant in composition. They're um, slightly normally zoned, not very much. Um, and we can use the phase equilibria to uh, estimate the temperature over any temperature changes. And there aren't major resorption surfaces in them. A very, there are some very subtle ones. So they, they look as though they represent almost continuous growth. And we can estimate the temperature with a, with a plus or minus 
And um, so we don't think that during the rim growth, the temperature fluctuated enormously. Uh, the cores of the crystals are completely different matter. They probably suffered very uh, a prolonged uh, storage at what very wide range of temperature conditions in the source region. We have no constraint over them. Please. Uh, it's low, in fact, and um, now, of course, as you know, carbon dioxide is rather difficult to, um, uh, to measure because of the sequestration into the bubble problem. Um, all our melt inclusions uh, of the silicic magmas contain no more than 100, 150 ppm, so it's quite low, uh, which rules out another possibility that the crystallization event was CO2 fluxing because you'd need... We know from the phase equilibrium that you need to flux it with hot, more CO2 than that. Um, Santorini basalts only contain, we've only measured up to about 1200 ppm. Uh, we can't see any CO2 in the bubbles by Raman. Uh, and when we have bubble free melt inclusions, they have the same CO2s as the bubble present CO2 uh, um, melt inclusions. So overall, the answer to the question is Santorini magmas seem to be relatively poor in CO2. Um, what's my feelings about that? Uh, I don't have any particular feelings about, except the implications for this model, which is CO2 fluxing is, is not a particularly important process in producing these evidence that I've described. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. I, d I don't know. I'd, ha I'd, I'd have to think about that. Yeah. Okay. Let us thank again Tim for a great lecture. Thank you. Our next Bowen recipient. is Steve Goldstein. Steve, please come up. The citation for Steve Goldstein will be given by Al Hoffman. Al, please. The citation I'm going to give is a, going to be a bit of a hybrid, I guess, uh, because the nomination of Steve was done by Charlie Langmuir, and he wrote a citation, the complete text of which you can read in EOS. So I will give you some excerpts from Charlie's uh, uh, citation here and then add maybe a few remarks of my own. Uh, okay, so here comes Charlie. For what accomplishments has Steve Goldstein received the Bowen Award? He hasn't received it yet, but okay. <clears throat> the answer from the community would be diverse. For paleoceanographers, it would be because he pioneered neodymium isotopes as an ocean circulation tracer. For those interested in continents, it would be his contributions to understanding continental growth. 
For mantle geochemists, it would be about the origin of mantle isotope heterogeneity in processes at ridges and convergent margins. In each of these communities, the view would be that the honor was overdue, while knowledge of his specific contributions in the other areas uh, that those members uh, that thought highly of Steve would be unlikely to be fully appreciated. So, Steve, Steve's breath was evident as a graduate student with his classic papers using neodymium isotopes in river sediments to constrain continental growth and then the mantle plane in nature uh, that first identified clear systematics of mantle isotope components and his use of orthogenic minerals to constrain seawater isotope compositions and so forth. Returning to Lamont from Max Planck, Steve showed great persistence in developing neodymium isotopes as a definitive measure of circulation, showed how ocean-rich basalts are consistent with the origin of mantle heterogeneity by low-degree melt metasomatism, and co-led the Dead Sea Drilling Project. Through these diverse contributions, Steve has demonstrated creativity and rigor and acted as a generous collaborator and mentor. We would all become broader and better educated if we were to familiarize ourselves with Steve's work beyond our own specialties. So my personal remarks follow. It's been my privilege to have Steve in mind for I think a total of 11 years, way back when. I have come to appreciate his rigor and originality in discussion and also his scrupulous honesty which characterizes Steve's behavior. There is no element of exploitation in his interactions with other people. Fair treatment of students and colleagues alike are very important to him. This has some frustrating consequences. Discussions with Steve often result in the interjection from Steve, wait a minute. <laughs> this, or yeah, or just a second. Well, this just a second can extend the discussion for another half hour or so. Anyway, uh, his, one of his least expected qualities, or at least I would not have expected him to be a good administrator. But when he became chairman of his department, the prominent member of the visiting com uh, committee told me, you know, Steve is the best department chairman they ever had. Hmm. But you get no awards for that, okay? Not even for answering your email. You do get awards for making fundamental contributions in mantle geochemistry paleo and paleoceanography, and Steve has done them all, so congratulations to the Bowen Award. The 2018 Norman L. Bowen Award is presented to Stephen Goldstein for outstanding contributions to volcanology, geochemistry, and petrology. Thank you, Steve, and we look forward to your lecture. Okay, well, thank you, Bill and Al and Charlie. Um, this has given me a new appreciation of um, being the concept of being deeply honored and deeply humbled. And um, is there a, yes, there is, okay. And really, um, I had to think very hard about whether I would should really give this particular talk in this session because, I mean, it, it is VGP. And um, I'll say a couple, a little bit more just in a couple of minutes about that. But I, first thing I want to do, like Tim, you know, um, we don't work by ourselves. And I realized when I was thinking about, you know, who to 
acknowledge um, I've been around for a long time, I guess, and I've accumulated a lot of people who really deserve to be acknowledged. And, um, and what's going on here? Going the wrong way. No? Okay, here we go. Sorry. And so there are a lot of people on, on the list, but, you know, they all deserve to be there. And, um, and I feel like they've all taught me a lot more than I've taught them, and I hope that I've um, actually contributed something to them, too. That goes for all of my mentors and, col and main big collaborators and my students, postdocs, and, of course, the technicians who keep things going at Lamont. Um, I, many people who aren't on this list, um, I have a lot of amazing colleagues at Lamont, and I had a lot of amazing colleagues at MPI who have been a continuous source of inspiration. And there, um, of course, I'd like to thank the Bowen Award Committee, and I don't want to forget them. And then there's my family, who um, has, um, I appreciate the fact that they've been willing to put up with me. So, now I'll say a little bit more about this talk. Um, when I started graduate school, VGP was the AGU section home for geochemists, regardless of their focus. And um, many geochemists have addressed a big, wide variety of subjects in the earth and space sciences. And I think that VGP is special as the broadest section of AGU, and that's partly because geochemistry is an important part of every discipline. And in my view, its universality should be embraced by VGP, and I've decided to do that in this talk. So that's why I'm giving this talk. Um, approaches that originated in solid earth geochemistry and cosmochemistry can have um, very important applications throughout the earth and space sciences, which I'm hoping to illustrate in this lecture. And I've tried to prepare it in a way that I hope will be palatable to the VGP community, which is to say that I know that VGPers don't like time series. I can't avoid time series with this, but actually the people in the ocean oceanographic um, sections don't really like scatter plots, I think. So I, if I have time, I'll show a couple of scatter plots. Okay, but I, I want to start by talking about Norman Bowen. And this is actually his paper in the American Journal of Science from 1915 um, about crystallization and differentiation in silicate liquids. And I want to read a little part of it. So he starts, ever since Darwin pointed out the possible importance of the sinking of crystals in a fluid magma, what is going on here? This process, okay, ever since Darwin pointed this out, this process has received some attention from geologists when considering the causes that have brought about the observed variety of igneous rocks. The process has met on the whole with little favor. The question is not infrequently dismissed with the statements that there is no evidence that crystals sink in magmas and he writes, in this writer's opinion, the sinking of crystals will be accepted as a very fundamental importance. And um, actually, he wrote this in 1915. He published his reaction series in 1922. And he actually used experimental results to conclude that the fractionation and settling of olivine is an important process. This is from his charge. It's from his paper. And the reason why I'm talking, there are two reasons why I'm talking about this. One is that um, in this paper, the Palisade sill was the main example he used to argue for crystal fractionation. And he attributes the um, differences in the um, composition at the bottom to the top as due to magma, um, as due to um, olivine crystal settling. And that's relevant to us here because actually the Palisade Sill is what links Bowen and Lamont. 
And it turns out that eight previous Bowen awardees have spent significant time working on the Palisades sill. Or I, I should say on top of the Palisades sill, basically. And um, three of them are professors, or were professors. Four of them were on sabbatical, and Tim Elliott was a postdoc. And so this is the Palisades sill. There was a landslide that occurred just a mile south of Lamont. And I just want to note that I'm pretty sure I'm the only one who's published data on the Palisades sill. That's relevant to this, and I'll show you why. So this was in 2015. It turns out it's the centennial year, I didn't know that, of Bowen's um, paper, OK? So he argued um, differentiation by crystal fractionation. And we can see these are the data from the dot from the from the sill and we can see that the isotopes stay the same um, through the fractionation sequence and in fact that's what we teach um, in our introductory class needs to happen but it really does and the other thing that he argued is that there's no assimilation of the country rock and we can see that there's no um, indication of mixing or assimilation of the country rock. So a um, hundred years later, we actually managed to corroborate his, um, his conclusions, OK? But I'm going to move to the oceans and geochemistry. And actually, I just want to point out that studies of ocean water um, today in the past and marine sediment go back to the early days of modern geochemistry. And in fact, Claire Patterson's um, um, seminal paper on the age of the Earth actually was based on analyses of, of ocean sediments. Um, and it continued in 1959. There's the lead isotopes and manganese nodules. And um, so on in 1970 was when the first paper on um, seawater, the seawater strontium curve was um, published. OK, and I'm going to start by talking about um, Broker's um, Great Ocean Conveyor. And that's kind of what drove me into to being diverted into this um, subject. And it was, it's driven by, so this is his um, cartoon. It's driven by the sinking of water in the North Atlantic to form North Atlantic deep water, which basically drives a global um, um, current system. And the flow going to the south, to the Southern Ocean, is equal to about 80 Amazon rivers. And so that emphasizes the magnitude of the flow. And what's happening is that that flow is being compensated by the Gulf Stream, which is bringing heat from the tropics to the high latitudes. And so, um, and is keeping um, northern la latitudes warm. And it's a more complicated, the reality is more complicated than Broker's diagram. But I think that Broker's diagram gives the concept um, more easily than this one. And one of the ex examples is that this is from Cornwall in Great Britain. And it's a palm tree. And we can see that palm trees can grow in Great Britain. Palm trees can't grow in New York. And Great Britain is much farther north. And so that's, the, you know, that's showing partly the impact. And Broker noted that the formation of North Atlantic deep water is driven by salinity. And that, that's due to um, evaporation loss and eva evaporation and loss in heat. And that makes the water salty and negatively buoyant. And when I, when, I real, when I learned that, you know, I realized that that, and Broker pointed out, that that makes it a very unstable system because it's depending upon salinity to be able to, to happen. And so he suggested that it was unstable and suggested that it might be an important trigger for climate changes. And if not, it, had, it would be an important amplifier for climate change because, for example, if you have an ice age, there's less 
North Atlantic deep water formation, you'd have a weaker Gulf Stream, which brings less heat up to the, um, from the tropics to the high latitudes, which will help stabilize the Ice Age. And for interglacials, you'll have the opposite. And that scenario has actually been the, um, pl uh, served as, as plots for things like bad movies, okay? Um, so I wanna talk about this and we're going to use uh, um, an acronym and I know that um, VGP people are okay with acronyms, so I'm gonna give you one acronym and it's the AMOC. And that means the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. And that's basically the formation of North Atlantic deep water. And if we look at salinity plots in the South, in the southern, South Atlantic, we can actually see um, the water masses. And we can see, so this is a salinity plot. The high, salini the sal high salinity wedge is North Atlantic deep water that's moving south. It's sandwiched by two southern ocean um, water masses that are moving north. And the idea behind what I'm going to show you is that if this conveyor really weakens during ice ages, basically this wedge should basically move farther north. Okay? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present evidence in a tour of some of our group's work over the years that if we analyze the right chemical phases in the right cores, neodymium isotopes can be a great tracer of the AMOC both today and in the past. Now, in the ocean sciences types communities, um, there's still a lot of skepticism about that. And it's true that we don't know very well enough uh, um, what the sources are and the sinks of marine neodymium, but we know how it works today with circulation, and so I'll maintain that it actually works well for tracing the AMOC. Okay, and so this is a plot of the Elderfield proxy confidence curve, and it, it can be applied to any technique. And basically what happens is you come up with a technique and you're really optimistic, then you find out that there are big problems and your confidence just um, basically sinks and then you kind of figure out what's good about it and what's bad and you're in a realism phase. And I think that with this proxy, we've reached that phase, okay? So I wanna point out that VGP and ocean circulation, or neodymium isotopes and ocean circulation actually started out as a VGP thing. And it started out, um, it was mainly mapped by Jerry Wasserberg and students and postdocs in the 1980s. And in the 1980s, he, he complained a lot that it was not being appreciated by oceanographers. And in fact, in the late 1990s, an eminent oceanographer described neodymium to me as an, quote, obscure element, which I found interesting because that particular one um, analyzes an element called praseodymium a lot. Okay, but now it's actually being used, um, actually it's a key trace element and isotope that's used in every cruise of the International Geotraces program, which is really mapping the chemistry of the oceans nowadays. Okay, so how, do I, how did I get into this? Um, Charlie talked and Al talked about me as being broad in some way. It turns out that, and I, I think of myself as being broad, but actually it turns out this is the first thing that I got into in graduate school. And Keith O'Neill had just published this paper, right? And um, he suggested that I continue where, he, where they left off. Um, and it was the first characteristic of characterization of neodymium isotopes in seawater. And what they did is they concluded the oceans were well mixed by analyzing five Pacific samples, which had um, about the same neodymium isotope ratio and seawater isotopes. They measured one Indian sample that showed higher strontium isotopes and lower neodymium isotopes and concluded it was contaminated and they ignored it. Um, it turned out 
they stopped a little bit too soon, and if they'd done more analyses, they would have found that um, the data in the oceans show clear differences it, between the oceans and distinct ra ranges within each one. And um, when I started to work on it, I actually found out that Ke the Wasserberg's group was way ahead, and I decided to publish what I had and cut my losses um, and focus on something else. And I think that's a lesson for any early career people because I ended up um, working on this and um, that was a good thing, okay? I think um, a lot of people are probably familiar with this paper. And um, so their head start was actually serendipitous for me and it got me into other things. And so um, for um, early career people, don't worry about it, there's lots to do, okay? By the 1990, by 1992, it was clear that um, there were clear differences between the different oceans, and this is a map that Francis Albert and I um, published where the isotope ratio goes with the color of the rainbow, and we can see the North Atlantic is blue, the Pacific is red, and everything in between is um, intermediate. And so some of us thought that neodymium isotopes would, could be a good important, uh, a good be an important um, tracer of ocean circulation. And one of the things that struck me years later is that we see this wedge in the Pacific here from manganese nodules and crusts where each sample averages tens to hundreds of thousands of years integrated. And right here, Peter Schlosser, nine years later, published this paper showing the influx of bomb radiocarbon into the Pacific, and it's basically taking the same path. You know, two completely different time scales, and, um, and so I found that amazing. And so we can ask the question, well, how well, before we actually look into the past, we have to ask the question, how well do neodymium isotopes in, in seawater trace the AMOC today? And the answer is very well, and this is the proof. This is a um, section along the, west, um, the western Atlantic, north to south. This is the salinity um, profile. This is um, the analyses of 272 seawater samples by this heroic graduate student who just um, defended her thesis. And we can see that we can see the same pattern in both of these, um, in both of these, I mean, they're almost, all, basically they're nearly identical um, patterns. Okay, and I won't get it, well, yeah, I will, okay. Out of, this is, I mean, it's amazing. If we predict the neodymium that we would expect by the mixture of water masses, actually 54% of her data are within error. And if we consider that there's geologic slop somehow and, you know, things aren't totally heterogeneous, we'll, we would find that actually 89% of the data are within one epsilon neodymium unit of their predictive va predicted value. And so it's clear that today um, neodymium isotopes really are tr uh, tracing the circulation. Okay, so that's the takeaway for this, that today it works. So what about the past? Well, in the 1990s, there was a lot of great work on manganese crust, mainly by the Onions groups and the Halliday groups, but there, the temporal resolution is low. You can see that this goes from zero to 60 million years, and there was little interest from the ocean climate community who really cared about subglacial timescales. And, um, but what these data did was they, um, they constrained the end members in the North Atlantic and the Pacific through time. And one of the things that we can see is that the end members st are stable 
Um, basically, this is showing the last two, two million years where the North Atlantic has a value of around minus 13 and the Pacific has a value of around minus four. So that's good because that, allow, that actually would allow us to um, um, look at variability in between these two end members um, as long as it, um, the, the system behaves itself. So one of the things that we realized in the 1990s is that um, if we're going to um, we're, if we're going to use neodymium isotopes to trace the conveyor, we need to work on deep sea cores and the same ones as the paleoceanographers were doing at their high resolution. And so we, our first attempt was um, published in 2000. Um, this is my um, heroic um, collaborator, Sidney Hemming who's been doing this with me ever since we started together at Lamont. And basically, we, we um, decided on this core here. It's way down here in the southern, very close to the Southern Ocean. The general idea is that, once again, if the AMOC weakens during cold climate, um, the, this wedge would move northward, and we would see a weaker North Atlantic neodymium signal in the South Atlantic. And this is what we saw, in fact, so this is the last 80,000 years, and the Holocene, North Atlantic deep water is up, Pacific deep water is down, and we saw these glacial interglacial changes. And we said, we thought, okay, this corroborates that um, we can see um, stronger AMOC during warm climate, weaker AMOC during cold climate, and this was actually followed by a very heroic um, profile by Alex Piotrowski. Now he's, um, he's, he's at Cambridge, and he did all of this by Tim's, which is absolutely amazing. And it's a, it's a pivotal record. It's basically showing um, the, the um, high resolution record over the last 90,000 years, and it's superimposed on um, benthic um, foraminiferal carbon isotopes, which is also a, an established paleoceanographic proxy for other reasons um, because of the differences between the Atlantic and the Pacific. And we can see that basically they superimpose on each other. Okay, so what this means is that if you believe benthic carbon and most Paleoceanographers do believe in pit benthic carbon as a proxy for tracing the AMOC. You should believe in neodymium. And actually, the reason why neodymium might have some advantages is that the carbon isotopes um, are an open system. And basically, for example, in this record that we're looking at, um, this is the glacial Pacific. This is the, um, the, Holoc the Holocene um, Atlantic, and we can see that the record itself overshoots the, the glacial Pacific. So we can't use, we can, we, it seems to follow ocean circulation, but it, it's, uh, non, it's an open system, it's not quantitative. Um, carbon isotopes are, are affected by circulation, but also biological productivity, global carbon budget, et cetera. Um, with neodymium, that's not the case. The range of the South Atlantic record is here, and it's between the North Atlantic end member and the North Pacific end member, so we can actually possibly quantify our results. Um, the other thing about this record by Alex is that if we compare that record to Greenland ice, and this is Greenland ice over the past 80,000 years where down is cold and up is warm. We can see that every time Greenland got warm, um, we're showing a stronger North Atlantic signal. And every time the Greenland got cold over these short time scales, we're seeing a weaker North Atlantic signal. 
Okay, so basically the signal that we're seeing way down in the South Atlantic are driven by northern hemisphere events. That is, the changes in the AMOC. And if I'm going to just focus in on this little, the um, deglaciation, um, and we just to um, illustrate the fact that we can quantify the changes, and this is actually showing that um, between the last glacial and the Holocene, we're seeing a, during the last glacial a 40 to 50 percent higher Pacific component than we are during the Holocene. So we can really see the differences. Okay, so the takeaway message of this part of the talk is that neodymium isotopes in marine precipitates can be used to trace the AMOC at high temporal resolution and to quantify the changes. Okay, I also, it can also be used um, to look at forcings and responses and we can um, address the, um, the question that Wally Broker posed, which is, is the AMOC a trigger for major climate transitions? And um, what we're going to do is combine um, carbon and neodymium to address forcings and responses. And the um, hypothesis is that if this, the AMOC tri triggers glacial interglacial transitions, then the, the neodymium should lead the carbon. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do something that we like to do here in the VGP section. We're going to look at some cross plots. And I think this is something that we may have actually um, contributed to the, um, to the oceanographic communities, is the um, possibility of using cross plots. Okay, so the next slide is a scatter plot. So this is what we get if we cross plot the carbon and the neodymium. And actually, the um, oceanogra oceanographers, when I showed it to them, they weren't very impressed with it. Actually, if you work on ocean island basalts, I, you might even think this is pretty good. Okay. So, but you know, we do get a glob. And um, what we're going to do is this is plotting everything. And since we're looking at transitions, uh, what I'd like to do is just shift to the transitions, and if we shift to the transitions and basically not look at these data here and these data here, um, we go from there to there. So we go from a glob to actually something that's more like a parallelogram. And I'm going to look at, show a movie, and we're going to go into the Ice Age and out of the Ice Age looking at each different time, time slices. So this is the end of the last interglacial. On this diagram of neodymium versus carbon isotopes, this is where we go. And we're going to go into the glacial. And what happens is, first we go down, and then we go over. OK, and then we get into the ice age. So what we've done is we've seen that the carbon leads and the neodymium follows. Now if we go from the glacial into the Holocene, we start here, we go up here, and then we go back here, and then we go to the Holocene. So basically, once again, the carbon leads, and the neodymium follows. Okay, so what that means is that in both cases, we can see that the carbon change leads the neodymium change. And what that means is that the um, carbon cycle changes before the ocean does. And we can see that um, neodymium is not, or sorry, neodymium, the AMOC is not causing the trigger. It's responding to what is already happening. OK, so that's that takeaway. I'm going to talk now about the uh, mid-Pleistocene transition from 40,000 to 100,000 um, year ice ages. And it turns out that neodymium isotopes identify a critical AMOC weakening that happened um, during the mid-Pleistocene transition. So for those of you who aren't familiar with LRO4, 
This is basically the history of the Ice Ages from the um, standpoint of deep um, ocean oxygen isotopes. And basically, it's showing the variability um, mainly in um, ice volume, but also partly in temperature, where warm is at the top, cold is at the bottom. And what we can see is that ice ages in the 100,000 year world are more, um, we can see the, um, are more intense than during, in the 40,000 year world and that there was a transition that occurred around between a million and 600,000 years ago, okay? So during the 100,000 year world, there's more intense ice ages and larger ice sheets, okay? And the reason for this change is a mystery because there's no change in the way the Earth orbited the sun over that period. And so that implies that there had to be a change in the um, ocean, atmosphere, cryosphere system. And there's been a lot of explanations that have attributed, attributed it to either global processes or the southern hemisphere processes or northern hemisphere processes or the tropics. And um, it's still an open question and so a couple of years ago, we, um, we um, analyzed a couple of sites in the far south Atlantic um, that, that come from, that basically um, lie on both the upper and the lower boundaries of this present day North Atlantic deep water wedge. And I want to remind everybody that um, if there's a weaker AMOC, um, we expect the North Atlantic deep water um, to withdraw northward. Okay, and actually this was meant to be preliminary, preliminary data for a possible NSF proposal, and we actually ended up with a science paper. And so what we did was we targeted samples from glacial and interglacial maxima, and in this case we're actually connecting gla interglacial maxima, which are red, because red is warm, and glacial maxima, which is blue, because blue is cold, and up means a stronger AMOC, um, and so on. Okay, and these are our results. So basically, if we look at the 100,000 year world, we see a big difference between glacials and interglacials, and a much stronger interglacial AMOC and a much weaker glacial AMOC. But if we go back into the 40,000 year world, we see actually very small differences between the glacials and the interglacials. And if we go in between, what we actually see is um, something that we call the mid Pleistocene transition AMOC crisis, where at 950,000 years ago, there was this major weakening of the AMOC for the first time. Um, it remained weak through a glacial, an interglacial, and another glacial. Um, and after that, it basically rebounded. And that is actually, it actually formed the first 100,000 year glacial cycle. And we've been in the 100,000 year world ever since. Okay, and actually, um, in this particular core, this is the benthic carbon record. And actually, you know, there might be an indication of what happened, but it's much less clear than in the neodymium record. Okay, so the takeaway is that. Neodymium isotopes established major weakening of the AMOC, which was critical to the mid Pleistocene transition that lasted 100,000 kiloyears um, at 950,000 years ago. Okay, I'm going to finish this with our current research, and these are the people who are involved in the current research, and the you know, the, the issue with what I just showed you is that we extrapolated the whole Atlantic from two far south cores, and that's a stretch. 
And what we've decided to do is really find out what's really happening throughout the Atlantic. And so what we've been working on the last few years is a transect from the far north to the far south. And basically, we're targeting the whole basin and exploring linkages between the AMOC and different Ice Age conditions. And the aim is to analyze the same time interval in each core and create profiles of the real Atlantic circulation through time. And I'm just going to show you some highlights. And so highlight number one, the Atlantic tra transect data strongly confirms that we really are seeing the AMOC and not local or other effects. OK, and I'm going to show you a diagram. Don't freak out by it, because it looks complicated. But all I want you to see is that we're going from purple to blue to green to yellow. That's going from north to south. And it turns out that at each point in time, we see increasingly weaker North Atlantic signals as we go from north to south. OK? And that is really strong evidence that the data reflect the AMOC through time, because that could not happen randomly, that at every point in time, we're seeing the right sequence um, going from north to south. OK, so we're really seeing the signal. OK, highlight number two, the crisis interval this unprecedented weak AMOC is observed throughout the Atlantic Basin. And we can see that if we go from purple to blue to green to red, we can see how everything just kind of crashed in the whole basin. OK. As a result of having this data, we can now delineate the circulation modes associated with different climate regimes through time. OK, and for example, this is showing cartoons of, the, of different, um, different circulation modes. And we have the interglacial mode, where we have a lot of North Atlantic stuff going into the South Atlantic. Sorry, we have. The glacial mode, where basically North Atlant the North Atlantic pulls back, and there's a lot of Southern Ocean stuff, water going into the North Atlantic. We have these extra weak intervals, like the MPT um, AMOC crisis, where basically North Atlantic deep water really pulls back, and we have a lot of um, Southern Ocean water that goes far, far north and so on and so forth. We can see weaker AMOC during post-MPT post glacials compared to pre-MPT glacials, while the glacial interglacials are generally similar before the MPT and after. And we're just going to use the um, North Atlantic record here. This is the whole record. This is the same record. Um, just showing the glacial maxima, glacial and, and interglacial maxima. And we can see this is the, pre um, the value of the pre-crisis glacials. This is the median value, and this is post-crisis glacials. We can see that the AMOC is weaker while, gla um, while ice ages are more intense. And we can see that Actually, during interglacials, there's not much of a difference pre-MPT crisis and post, or pre-MPT and post-MPT. OK? There's a period of the, that's known as the period of lukewarm interglacials following the MPT, where there, um, it turns out there was weak AMOC during these lukewarm interglacials. We can see that. Then this is the period here, and we can see how that basically during this entire interval, we're seeing the effects of having weaker um, AMOC um, compared to both pre-MPT and post and and the rest of the hundred thousand year world. Okay. Finally, um, we also can see uh, that the AMOC crisis. Um, 
had a north of northern hemisphere trigger, and we can see that when we look at this part of the record, where uh, we can see that there's something happening here during glacials that's not happening either before or after. And it's a unique interval showing increasingly strong shield signals during glacials as we're approaching the crisis. And um, in fact, this is a, a close-up of just the glacials, and we can see that, um, that basically the um, value of the North Atlantic is getting more negative. That means increased shield erosion and this is happening more with each glacial. And then finally, right before the crash, there's this huge um, excursion event that reflects major input of cratonic neodymium, and then there's the crash of the whole system. And this timing strongly indicates, implicates northern hemisphere glacial activity as the trigger for this collapse. And I believe that what it's reflecting is shedding of the um, Northern hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere Shield Regolith. And so actually, among all of this, these, these um, possible explanations, I'd actually um, like to highlight that one of them is suggesting that loss of soil regolith resulted in increased friction of, um, of the high latitude continent, which allowed um, um, the the glacier to stabilize over the Canadian Shield and, um, and Northern Europe. And that might be what we're actually seeing as we're leading up to this, um, as we're leading up to this climax. So I just have a couple of thoughts to end on for early career scientists. Um, everybody's different, follow your interests. If your interests are broad, geochemistry offers great opportunities to learn about and address a wide range of topics, and to work with amazing scientists to make important contributions that can go across disciplines. And this keeps geochemistry exciting, and there are always great new things to learn about and to do. And I'd like to thank you for um, listening to me today. Again, thank you, Steve. Terrific stuff. I'd like to ask, raise your hand and please, oh, there is a microphone, so Anat has the microphone. Questions? No questions. Ah, Herr Hoffmann. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't really need a microphone, I think. <laughs> uh, my, my question is, uh, before that, the, that crisis, uh, the, um, the mid-Pleistocene crisis, were the average warm times higher than afterwards? Or is that just an impression I got looking at the diagrams? And did that have anything to do with it, if it's true? This is, I mean, th this is what you'd want to look at for um, looking at the intensities of, um, of um, glacials and interglacials, right? This is the um, carbon, this is the oxygen isotope record of the deep ocean. And I would say that um, there's no um, real indication here that there's that much of a difference between um, I was just about to take this home. 
Basically, if we look at the intergla if we look at the interglacials, I mean, there there are there's there's there is a real history of these interglacials that reflect um, changes in the insulation. Um, act that's that's that I don't have a um, I, don't, I don't have a slide about, but we don't see basically any significant difference. Um, I don't think between um, the 40,000 year world and the 100,000 year world, whereas what, where we really see the difference is um, basically in the glacials, okay, which is once again reflecting um, higher, greater ice volume and um, some combination of greater ice volume and um, lower temperatures. Over here, please. Bernard. Coming. Uh, Steve, do you see evidence, or has anyone seen evidence for uh, the regolith material uh, entering the marine realm at that transition point? I mean, do you actually see evidence for shedding of the regolith? Ask me that in about a year. I'm hoping that um, we'll have we'll have data on that, but um, we don't have data yet. Nobody, I mean, nobody's published data on that yet. But it's an obvious thing to look at based on um, based on these observations, and we have samples um, on hand that we're going that that are going to be analyzed. But did you actually say what caused the change from the 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 two be, between the two worlds? Um, what actually caused the change? Well, let's see. No question that neodymium is fantastic. <laughs> I think I, I mean, I think I actually have some. Okay, one of the things that I, I mean, I thought that I, I thought that I had too many slides actually, okay? And I didn't really, and I, and I ha even have better slides about this, but um, one of the, um, one, one of the other things that happened just at the same time is that there was a big change in, in, the, in carbon dioxide. And um, so actually, um, actually at, at the same time that this happened, carbon di dioxide went down significantly. And um, a couple of other aspects, I didn't want to get into details, is that this interglacial here um, where the conveyor did not turn on again, which is actually unique in history, um, as at least as, as far back as we, as we know it at this point, was a very weak interglacial. Okay? And so, um, actually I can show it to you in the other diagram. Whoops. Well, maybe I can't. Okay, anyway, it, it was a very weak interglacial, and at the same time, um, it was, there was a very weak, um, it was, there was a very weak um, interglacial in, in, in um, Antarctica, and Actually, one of, the, one of the papers that I refer to, um, in one of the papers that I refer to, Harry Elderfield, um, Puck, Harry, Harry Elderfield concluded that, that during that same period, there was a major expanse of the, um, of the Arctic ice cap. And so, sorry, the Antarctic ice cap. And 
So there were a lot of things that basically came together at that time. Um, and so if, if it's, if, um, if, you know, the right, if, if the regolith was shed from the northern continents, um, there was anomalously low insulation for 100,000 years, and there was um, anomalously low summer insulation in, in, in Antarctica at the same time, which all facilitated um, the, the um, construction of, of bigger ice caps. On top of that, there was the um, drawdown of CO2 and a sluggish, um, a sluggish conveyor actually is a way to store CO2 in the oceans, then there was a lot of different things that came together that could well have basically tipped the, um, tipped the system. Okay, but I didn't, um, I didn't prepare that because I thought that was going too far beyond um, the subject of this of this talk. Steve, um, a fascinating talk. I just wonder if you, for, for the sort of lay person, as it, if it were in this area, could you explain what, what's the fundamental difference between the neodymium signature of the Pacific and the Atlantic? Why are they different? And why have they been stable for so long, given that geologies change with time due to plate tectonics. Okay. Actually, that's a good question. That um, fund the, the fundamental difference is that if we look at the North Atlantic, right, basically the North Atlantic is, I, th th this is, this is the, um, this is the simple explanation, the, the complicated explanation, actually nobody knows the real answer, but the simple explanation is that the neodymium going into the North Atlantic is um, coming from the old sh shield areas. Okay, so it's going to have um, isotope ratios that reflect ancient continental crust. Okay, so it's got, it's, and, and we can actually see that it's um, very, very, very low values. In the Pacific, you know, you're surrounded by the, by, by all of the volcanic arcs, and um, as well as whatever's coming in from older continental crust, you have a significant input of volcanic neodymium, and that's what would give it um, the higher values. And so that all sounds logical, and that is clearly where the answer is, but the details um, are really hard to, um, are, are hard to show, okay? And for example, nobody's actually been able to show um, that there's a significant source of volcanic neodymium. If, they're looking at the processes, okay? And for example, Alex, Alex Halliday's group way back in Michigan um, showed that the neodymium that's being blown into the Pacific Ocean um, looks like continental neodymium, okay? But clear, and, and it's very, very much lower than the values that you see in the water. And my guess is that you know, volcanic, volcanic glasses ha, um, are much more reactive than, you know, old terrigitous sediments, and so we're seeing the um, impact of that. What's really, I would say, um, intriguing is why these values um, are so constant over such long periods of time. But that's the data. So that's why I say that we know, we know the system works, we don't quite know why, how it gets there.
Let us all again thank you to Steve and Tim. I remind everyone to come to the VGP reception tonight and uh, welcome and uh, congratulate our awardees, the Bowen awardees, the Kuno awardees, the daily lecturers, and uh, the various union medalists. Thank you.